Hey everyone, um, we're the warm-up act, but we have an incredible group of people here. We're gonna hit a lot of the themes that Bambi and Peter are gonna discuss tonight, and I'm, I'm just really excited to just take a seat back and just moderate a really great panel of people. So let's just start off, and we could just go down the line, starting with you, Saif. Let's get a temperature check on how you feel the country is doing, how the US is doing, through the lens of your work, your perspective, how you're thinking about the world. It's a great question. Uh, welcome everyone to Miami. Um, I think that the bottom line is that those of us who have heritage from other countries, I'm an immigrant to this country, my family escaped socialism in Guyana, and we moved to America when I was two years old. And my wife and I are parents of two teenagers. And the reality is when we think about where our country is right now, uh, against the backdrop of the world, China, an authoritarian government, locks down Bitcoin, it drives American competitiveness. Now we're the number one Bitcoin miner in the world. And when we think about it, also in the localized context of communities like Miami, where we have a leader in the form of Mayor Suarez who believes, let's get rid of taxes, let's ensure a public safety equation that delivers for all the residents, let's have a plan for functional zero homelessness, let's have a plan that engages with science, and at the end of the day, gets out of the way of those who are value creators. I think if you live in a community like Miami, and if you're lucky enough to call America home, then you can see quite clearly that our country is better positioned to win the second half of the 21st century than any other country on this planet. Because the last time I checked, no one is getting on a rickety boat to try to get to Pyongyang, North Korea, or Havana, or Guyana, or anywhere else where it's about more government as opposed to less government. So what we're seeing in Miami is clearly people are exiting parts of the world and this country where that's what's happening. But more importantly, I think I have a very, very sunny outlook about where we're going writ large. Doesn't mean to say we don't have actual challenges and every single day we don't have to do the homework, do the hard work to ensure that our competitive edge is maintained. But ultimately, the people who are pessimistic, I think are not spending enough time with American young people who, quite frankly, are the most vibrant force for change on planet Earth. I'm so happy you said that because you set Helen up really well for a bit of pushback on the young people part. But uh, let's go to you next, Dan. <laughs> I think America is actually going through like an interesting uh, sort of dual forces that are hitting in opposite directions right now, which is, you know, most sort of institutions in the United States, you know, trust is falling apart, they're decaying, whether you study, you know, federal government, university systems, um, you know, large hospital networks, all of them across a variety of different facets of uh, their operations are completely crumbling. And at the same time, there's this opposite trend, which I think is the much more important trend to actually study and is uh, more predictive of, you know, America's place uh, uh, in the world over the next you know, 20, 30, 40 years is fundamental scientific progress. If you study you know, new battery chemistries to allow for you know, denser uh, energy density, if you look at you know, the mRNA vaccine, if you look at the like, heaviest lift rockets and the most reusable rockets in the world, across all those technological fields, America is by far and above the like, number one uh, in terms of you know, pushing the fold and only continues to push it even further with a larger gap. And so, I think that you know, the, the future is going to look like eventually sort of replacing a lot of these institutions that are crumbling with sort of effectively like technology-based you know, equivalents of it. Of, you, know, uh, you know, Founders Fund over the past like two years has funded everything from like a pre-K replacement, a K through six replacement, and a high school replacement, um, and are starting to look at a university replacement. And so it's just wipe out all these institutions, effectively start from scratch, create independent sort of decentralized versions that are based off of technology and only continue to push the fold forward. Um, and I think that, you know, sort of technology in some ways is the cure to all of this. Of like, yes, you know, I think it's great to study social progress and social programs, but I think fundamentally, if you just push science as quickly and as far as possible, sort of social progress by default sort of snaps back and snaps forward. And I think America is doing phenomenally uh, in that regard. Uh, thank you, Marshall. Um, you're, you're right that Seif did set me up a little bit. Uh, generally speaking, young people are a great force for vibrancy, but unfortunately at the moment in the United States, young people are the least vibrant people in the entire country. Uh, I earlier this year published a book called Boomers, uh, The Men and Women Who Promised Freedom and Delivered Disaster. Uh, and not to give away how I feel about the baby boomers. Um, and the 
unfortunate fact is that the baby boomers have loomed large on the American stage since they showed up in the 1960s just because of sheer demographic heft. They've been the biggest market for advertisers, the, the largest voting block. And what that means is that their children, the millennials, have grown up in their shadow. And I don't know if that made it inevitable that millennials would be the least rebellious generation in American history, but that's how it's worked out. Um, millennials have been kind of denied their opportunity to move up through the generational progression. I mean, to say nothing of Gen X getting squeezed in between and, and never getting its moment at all. Uh, but the millennial perspective is never having grown up and taken leadership positions uh, because the boomers have just hogged all of the oxygen. Um, and the fact that millennials are dispositionally conformist possibly due to the factors that I just described, uh, the internet just kind of pours gasoline on that uh, because the internet is, among other things, an, an engine for enforcing conformity. So I'm a, a journalist uh, by profession, so I look mostly at how these trends shake out in politics, uh, and I think the fact that millennials are so conformist are always appealing to authority to enforce their will. Um, because they don't have the sense of independence and rebelliousness, because, uh, you know, that's a boomer thing. Um, the fact that they don't have that is going to make things very difficult uh, for well, conservatives, uh, like the people at my magazine, but our politics just in general and, and society. As a rebellious millennial that refuses to conform to the societal norm of having to wear two different shoes or two same shoes, <laughs> I may have to say at least there's one rebellious one. <laughs> What's... Um... Let's dive into each of your specific backgrounds in, in these themes. So, Saif, starting with you, I'd like you to talk about Miami. You've, you've referred to Miami as a movement. There's obviously the Twitter version of that that I'm sure everyone here is aware of. But I think the reason why people get excited is there's actually something to that that actually has broader lessons to the rest of the country and a broader argument about decentralization, which is what uh, Dion was getting at, too. So I would love for you to give context on that. Uh, that's a great starting point. Uh, I, I, think, I think it's important to begin with the kind of culture layer for Miami and understand part of the magic that people are experiencing, and Mayor Suarez talks a lot about that, is you have to understand that this city, the DNA, was hardwired by those who escaped the horrors of Castro's Cuba, those who are the descendants of the nightmare of the Holocaust, those who are the survivors of the ghost of Jim Crow, the grandchildren of doughboys who won World War II. So if you want to know the grit, the spunk that Miami has, it's hardwired into the DNA of people who their hardest day was yesterday and the past that they have escaped to be able to build where we are today. So I think that that just, that energy, that raw power that existed in turn of the century America and other great cities that long went out. I mean, I think there's a former mayor of Chicago who referred to their city as the, uh, the most American of American cities. I think in some regards, Miami is the most global of American cities in that within that hodgepodge, that culture layer has been a critical driver, right? So the one commonality, and we'll joke about it, is like, just don't be a jerk. That that's kind of the distinguishing line as opposed to trying to get into sort of a biographical grudge match about the hardship I suffered versus the hardship that you might have suffered. So that sort of is layer one of what defines, everybody's been through real stuff. And you can insert the word stuff with something else if we were you know, during the cocktail hour. People have been through real stuff to make Miami the city that it is. Mayor Suarez talks about this in, in the form of Miami's ascendance to becoming the capital of capital. And the hard facts, like, you know, you can, you can fight your doctor, but you can't fight the blood work. Half a trillion dollars worth of capital has moved into this city since the beginning of this year. We're number one in America for tech job growth year over year from Q2 2020 to Q2 2021. You look at the fact that major global companies like Microsoft have now set up a 50,000 square foot campus in downtown Miami, in the Brickell area. That's not just Latin American sales teams. Those are, those are product teams, those are engineers. 
And then you look at an area like crypto, which is obviously becoming a driver of American competitiveness. We've already, we can declare we've run the leg race as the North American hub and capital of crypto. But then beyond that, much more importantly, I think about young founders like Akshay. This kid just moved here two days ago because he's following what's going on. I'm giving him more clout than he might deserve, so if you do anything that's irresponsible, that's on you. Um, but, uh, but I think it kind of speaks to, it's not just about the colossal, like, we love that Founders Fund is here, that's a huge deal, et cetera, et cetera, right? Or Orlando Bravo. But I think the Miami narrative, those of us who come from many parts of the world or that are local born, those who survived the horrors of Jim Crow or some of the other things I've talked about, it's about that raw energy. Cities that are able to turn on the flow of talent in that way, not because of throwing public dollars and incentives and all that type of stuff, but because of a dream that is within reach, I think that is the Miami narrative. So when Mayor Suarez talks about capital of capital, yes, it's financial capital, but it's also cultural capital, it's social capital, and most importantly, the delta that we're winning on again and again and again, it's human capital. It's young people, both that are coming out of our local institutions and that are choosing affirmatively by getting on planes, living in Airbnbs, sweating it out till they figure it out. I think that that's indicative uh, of where ultimately our city is headed and why we're winning this leg race. I think to be definitive of what the future of the American city can look like in the second half of the 21st century. Dalian, this came out during your first answer, but you're a huge technological optimist, and you're obviously putting that on the line with Varda specifically, but you know, going to your Founders Fund background, going to things that Peter's written previously, there was this real narrative in the 2010s of technological stagnation, people not focused on those big moonshot companies. So I would just love to hear, we feel the optimism now, but I'd love for you to talk about that intervening period over the past eight or so years, like how we got here and how that has broader implications for the way the government thinks about the future of the tech industry, especially as questions about regulation and other things like that come up. Yeah, I mean, I obviously think about this mostly through the lens of venture capital, which is the industry that I work in, which, you know, at the end of the day, as a venture capitalist, like, I love to think that we're, you know, changing the world or that, you know, we're going to uh, help some, you know, underrepresented founders be able to build large companies. But at the end of the day, my only job is to make money. And it is to make a lot of money for the people that give me money. And that is the, like, fundamental tenant. And so during the, like, 2010s, and this is something where, you know, I think... Um, uh, you know, certain people within Silicon Valley have really promoted this idea of just like the like stagnation of like progress that I had disagreed with for quite some time and I think is only now coming to fruition. And the reason that I think it's coming to fruition is just like at the end of the day, investing returns come from alpha, i.e. like, you know, where is there uh, a lack of dollars, you know, flowing where there can be return. In 2010, at the time, there was almost no enterprise software deployed largely out in the world. The iPhone, a, like an amazing platform that you know, put a computer into everybody's pocket, was just out in the world. And by the way, at the same time, AWS, which made it so that the like, fundamental infrastructure costs for all software massively dropped. And so of course, where do all the dollars flow in venture capital? They flow towards software-based products. And so that's why you have you know, our original manifesto, which is we were hoping for you know, flying cars and instead got 140 characters. And over the past decade, while that has played out in investing, you've now started to see a whole reawakening of everything from like the hedge funds to the soft banks of the world now rush into this ecosystem and realize that effectively, you know, gold was on the ground and they can help pick it up. Turns out if you have, you know, too many, you know, gold diggers, there's not a lot of gold left anymore. And so the venture capitalists are now, you know, flowing towards where is the, you know, uh, next, uh, you know, greatest source of gold. And it turns out over the past decade, all the same sort of parallels that happened in software-based industries are now happening in the actual physical world, whether it's the fundamental, you know, infrastructure uh, costs necessary to, you know, build hardware products like the, you know, tools that you use for it, um, the, you know, uh, machine shops that are more software-defined, metal 3D printing, all of these things have now gone from having to be one-off, very esoteric technologies that you'd have to develop in-house to now, just like data centers were back in the day for software companies, to now being services that you can rely on externally. And so I sometimes talk about, the, talk about this in relation to Varda, where the reason that, yes, it's very ambitious to go out and build you know, space factories, in 2021, it's not that crazy. Like, it was crazy a decade ago. A decade ago would have been a multi-billion dollar project, only possible with governments. By the way, probably would have failed even if you had given it $5 billion. 
Nowadays, we're gonna get our first space factory for like $25 million. Now, it's not like, you know, you know, 100K and you know, a couple kids can do it in a garage with like, you know, grandparents' money or something like that, but it's now within the realm of venture capital. And it turns out that same thing is happening, and this is kind of what I discussed earlier, across battery chemistries, biotech, et cetera. And so my sort of overall thesis for, you know, this sort of, uh, you know, 2020s is, you know, the 2010s, uh, the returns were largely, largely driven by the world of bits. And in the 2020s, uh, the returns are largely going to be driven by the world of atoms plus bits, um, and that that is much more likely to now start to affect um, more day-to-day -day real life. If like in the grand scheme of things, if we had the same event you know, a decade ago, um, it wouldn't have looked that different. The microphones probably would have looked the same. We would have been wearing the same suits. The screens would have probably roughly looked the same. I think a decade from now, if we were to run the same event, I think the like, physical infrastructure of an event like this would look wildly, wildly different because the world of the atoms would have changed so much. Hell, the thing that you know, people like to you know, talk about in relation to like, progress stagnation was like you know, airplane airspeed, where it effectively hasn't changed since like, the late 1970s. Now, for the first time, I think there's like 18 different venture-funded airframes that go above walk Mach 1 that have raised north of $100 million. Probably the most you know, uh, notable one being Boom Aerospace, which just signed a $10 billion deal with United. And so I definitely, again, land on the techno-optimist side. I think all of these like, fundamental parts of day-to-day -day life are going to go through a huge upheaval in the next decade relative to the last, largely because capital flows where returns are, and right now, returns are in hardware. I like your point around what would this have looked like 10 years ago, because 10 years ago this would have been in San Francisco, um, or at least Palo Alto at a minimum. So like, that's a very direct way that this could sound foofy, but there actually is something going on in a narrative level. H Helen, there's a lot of optimism, there's a lot of techno-optimism specifically. Um, you write for a magazine, The American Conservative, that in many ways is interestingly skeptical of the technology industry, so not merely in the New York Times sense, but in, I think, a more less commonly held, less commonly articulated sense. So I'd like you to speak to that fact, but also the fact that in Boomers, which I seriously cannot recommend more to everyone here, it's an amazing book, you really speak to Steve Jobs and the evolving narrative of the technology industry at this generational level. So I, I would love you to just to give your broad perspective on the optimism, techno-optimism bit from all these angles here. Uh, yeah, you, you have correctly characterized my magazine. We do have genuine Luddites on staff. Uh, people who are this close to just you know going around town in masks, smashing everything with a QR code on it or a sensor, um, just you know take us back at least ten years. Um, I'm not one of them, but they yeah they're they're on my team. Uh, I am not an optimist, techno or otherwise. I don't know a single journalist who is. Maybe it's just an occupational requirement. Every journalist I know is a pessimist of of one degree or another. Um, and I, I say, if I hope that you and Mayor Suarez do succeed in building something here in Miami, because then we can start talking about the Florida model and not, as we in my industry have been for the last 10 years, the California model and the Texas model, because um, that's been sort of the dichotomy that we've been stuck in. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll stick with that dichotomy, because everyone in this room knows what I mean when I say the California model or the Texas model for how to run a society. Um, you know, Delian, you, you talked about stagnation being something that we have to fear. Uh, the reason I'm a pessimist is because stagnation is one of the better options that I see. Uh, I think uh, politically, uh, stagnation would be sort of fine. If we were in the same place 10 years from now, that would be a win. Uh, what we have to fear is degeneration, is, is things getting a lot worse. Um, and the reason why I'm so afraid that things will get worse is that if you look at how the Texas model and the California model work in practice, I, there's room for disagreement on this, but I think in terms of building a society that works, that makes people happy, that allows families to flourish, the Texas model wins. It just works better. Uh, it's what I'd like to see other states imitate. The California model leads to you know, Latin American levels of wealth inequality, uh, people sleeping on the streets. I, you know, you probably got a lot of San Francisco refugees in this room. I don't have to tell you the problems with the California model. But the trouble is that, um, well, let me bring, when I was a, an undergraduate in uh, writing my senior thesis in the religious studies department of all places, my topic was Catholic converts in England in the 19th century. Uh, and I eventually settled on the, the paradox at the heart of that phenomenon, which is that the best case scenario in the 19th century was to be a Catholic individual in a Protestant country. Because if you look around the Catholic world, Catholic Europe in the 19th century, the, those countries are not as well run. You will not enjoy as much liberty. 
but on the other hand, the uh, Catholic Church has many, many things to recommend it vis-a-vis -vis Protestantism. So in some ways, they were kind of parasitic on the Protestant model, but very happy doing their own thing. That's not a, a sustainable situation, and the modern equivalent, and, and what it's a metaphor for, and the reason I mention it, is California refugees um, enjoying their own boutique philosophy, uh, their own individual beliefs, but living in places and being functionally parasitic on people who believe very different things. The trouble is that if you get enough of them in a democracy, they will soon outvote the people who built the society that they wanted to move to, turn it to just like the place that they left for the exact same reasons and you get the same problems. And eventually, I worry that what we might see is an America where the Texas model is undone by its own success because it's inundated by people who are fleeing the failed model and then replicating the very thing that they fled. And that's my one concern or recommendation or pointer for the people who are building a new Miami model, a new Florida model here, which is that you have to make sure that doesn't happen. It's so weird after a year and a half of Zoom to have pauses for audience. I feel like we're on a sitcom or something for a live audience. Uh, Saif, let's pick up off of what Helen just said, which is that I actually really like her framing of these blue and red models, Texas and California, as serving of the point of stagnation. How, how do you, how does the Miami movement, how does the Miami project escape that? How does, how does Miami escape being a red thing? Because there are parts of this project which could easily be categorized as red, but there are also parts of this project that could be categorized as blue. Either one is not particularly helpful for what we are talking about here. So how do you think at a, at a structural level, beyond just politics, this is culture versus economics, this is the industries and the individuals, how do you escape the death trap that Helen is describing? So I'm gonna take a wild departure um, and say something. Uh, I won't spoil the end of the new James Bond, but um, I will say that sometimes in history, the past is not prologue. And I think that if one thing that we've experienced in the last 18 months is that we have entered into a completely different framework than anything that we've ever seen before. And that's at a multi-dimensional, cultural, social, economic, et cetera. So I think that obviously there's so much that we can learn from where we've been. There's obviously pre-existing sort of political partisan frameworks that you can't delink fully from. But I think there is also uh, a really unique element to communities that are not necessarily deeply tethered to uh, histories that have defined big chunks of America. And you know, where we're sitting, for example, we're in the heart of Miami. And you know, we're a city that is actually not a millennial. I would actually say we're much more Gen Z. So we're 119 odd years old uh, as an incorporated municipality. So if you drop out 100 years and say the first 100 was a practice run, we actually look and feel a little bit more like a member of Gen Z. So yes, we can engage in all kinds of discussions about generational attributes of different, uh, different uh, modalities, but I happen to be a parent of two Gen Z kids. One of them is 15 years old and is passionate about the belief that America has a role to play in Bitcoin mining as a geopolitical edge against China. And I have a 13-year-old that does TED Talks all around the community talking about a Bitcoin and crypto future wearing a kind of Steve Jobsian black shirt uh, to hide uh, you know, his love of rice and beans. Um, and so I, I kind of frame that to say that like we're building something anew here that is not meant to sound like some sort of wild-eyed optimism that doesn't recognize that there are real systemic substantive challenges. Miami has resilience issues. Guess what? Every coastal city on planet Earth has coastal resilience challenges to deal with. New York has actually been hit by more superstorms, direct impact than Miami has. You can say it's been luck for us and perhaps it has. It just means that we have to think a little bit more intentionally about what that actually means and also for those of us, regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum, 
as Delian said, you have to engage with science. You can fight the doctor, you can't fight the blood work when you look at certain trend lines. So I would say that like where we're at right now and uh, Mayor Suarez's vision, I think is, is scratching at something that people are being attracted to. The idea that uh, a city where public safety matters, a city where there's a plan for functional zero homelessness, a city where we've engaged in a completely different type of crypto project, which last time I checked right now, through the Stacks protocol on our Miami coin project, we've raised about $23 million that's gonna go to the city that's not through philanthropy, and heaven forbid, is not through taxation that ultimately is gonna to go to real projects that can then further drive uh, where we're actually going and tackling those difficult problems. So we sit at a place where we're building something anew. Doesn't mean to say we dealing from the past, but if you look at what Miami has been able to accomplish thus far, and also across the state of Florida, I wanna acknowledge that there's, there's something special happening in the Tampa Bay area. There's something ha special that's happening in Orlando. Shoot, there's spe something special happening in small towns in this state that I think really feels a little bit differently like other places, but I think that we're uh, a community that has been able to build something thus far that is somewhat untethered from that statement of that other mayor that sort of trumpeted the idea of Chicago being the most American of American cities. I think that we're scratching at something new, and so my belief is deeply connected to the fact that we're a community that's driven by uh, a sense around being problem solvers, uh, as opposed to being people that are cursing the darkness. Damien, I want to pick up something you said at the start where you talked about founders funds work to replace institutions, leveraging technology, speaking to the pessimistic parts of this conversation that I think everyone to some degree feels, to what degree can we survive on reforming existing institutions? maintaining them as they will, as they are, but largely checking them with alternatives, or simply burning everything down and starting over from scratch, leveraging the tools you're discussing here. How, how do you think about that framework? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, certain institutions like the United States, you know, federal government and, you know, most state governments, local police, et cetera, that obviously it, very difficult to, you know, burn down and, you know, entirely, you know, start from scratch. Uh, you're talking You'd about- you be surprised. You know, <laughs> it's true, that's true. You know, January 9th maybe showed otherwise. Um, but yeah, I think nation building is probably you know, too difficult of an activity for technology to take on. But I think where you can, uh, you know, creating sort of alternative pathways, and I think in some ways education is the one that I just like think about most cleanly, partially because I had such an alternative education path. I was a Teal Fellow, you know, back in the day, dropping out of school. Before that, my dad largely like taught me, you know, at home mathematics and doing math competitions. I basically never went through like traditional schooling system, and that to me is one of the most obvious ways to like influence sort of the next generations to have even further distrust in expectations from institutions by just allowing them to go literally from you know K all the way through. Um, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old, entirely sort of independent, you know, sort of study paths. Um, I think the, you know, other areas that you can, you know, start to break apart uh, particular institutions are, um, Certain, you know, regulatory regimes, like if you look at sort of how, uh, you know, SpaceX is, you know, dealing with the FAA in relation to Starship, it's effectively like a, here's our plan, here's what we're doing, and we're like, we're not slowing down, and if you do want to slow us down, this is going to be like a PR nightmare for you, right? Uh, whether it's, you know, uh, with Starship or, you know, Elon refusing to, you know, mask in like the Tesla factories. Uh, I think there's some amount of, as some of these sort of technological institutions and companies like Facebook, Google, you know, Tesla, et cetera, become large enough, they actually have almost as much power as, you know, federal governments and can actually choose to, uh, you know, in some ways set up, you know, their own regulations. Hell, even in some ways, like, you know, the information that we, you know, are fed and, uh, you know, what, what you see when you type into a search bar in Google is set by a team at Google that's effectively like a like legislative team. It's called the Google Policy Team, and that policy team effectively like sets like the laws of Google, um, and those laws effectively govern a lot of how our you know society works because it turns out the information that you're fed uh, you know changes your opinions on things. And so, I think there's so much of these institutions that are already in some ways getting replaced. We just need to hopefully not you know go into a regression and skate through to the point where uh, you know technology can kind of allow you to. Uh, you know, become an ultra libertarian where you have, you know, solar panels on your roof, your own power bank, you've got a, you know, food 3D printer in your home that is just absorbing carbon from the atmosphere and allow everybody to sort of become their own independent state and actually rely much less so, you know, on, you know, government for a variety of sort of fundamental services. That's probably the best way to eventually make it so that those institutions don't need to be relied on. Helen, I'm, I'm curious about 
going back to your really useful Texas, California, and then adding in the Miami third way part of the dynamic, how, and this is the question it doesn't think anyone particularly has a good answer to, but how, how does one consider or govern a country with these different models? Because the other thing I'll add to this too, I'm doing prep for our conference on Friday, um, and Antonio Garcia Martinez is, you know, uh, pull request Substack literally has an opener saying, this is framed around the idea that culture, economics, and politics are all downstream from technology. So there's another fourth actor here that one has to govern and consider as well too. So it just seems like this entire project is messy, overly complicated, and beyond comprehension. How should the people who are nominally tasked with comprehending it actually think about everything we just outlined? Uh, well, it's actually a one-word answer, and it's a word that you just said, which is institutions. Um, the biggest pushback that I get when I give my spiel about millennials being the least rebellious generation ever is always from people who work as managers. Uh, and what they say is, if millennials are the least rebellious people ever, how come none of my millennial employees will do what I tell them? <laughs> uh, and it's true that millennials do have a certain intractability. And the reason why is because millennials have grown up in a world denuded of institutions. They don't belong to anything. They don't feel a sense of loyalty to anything. If something's not working for them, their response is not to stick it out and fix it, but to pick up and leave. Um, and it's, it's not unnatural that millennials should be that way uh, because boomers, being the individualists that they were, destroyed every institution they got their hands on, from the family to politics to churches. I mean, Delian, you said that you know, an institution like the United States is pretty hard to, to rip up and, and start again. Well, the ripping up part is not that difficult. You just make it so, you know, if, if borders don't count for anything, and if everybody with any power or say in your society considers himself or herself a global citizen rather than a citizen of the United States first, well, then the United States may still exist on paper, but it doesn't mean anything. And that's kind of, we, we've got a lot of zombie institutions walking around that are like that, that exist on paper but don't mean anything. And they certainly don't mean anything to millennials uh, at, a, at a gut level. So for most generations, the task that they inherit is to preserve institutions and pass them on. Unfortunately, the task facing people right now is to build new institutions, maybe rebuild some old ones and then pass them down anew. Um, and I do think that technology can play a, a very powerful role in that. Um, I mean, it's, it's a small thing, but it's very heartening. Lots of millennials grew up with absent parents or with no parents or not, you know, only one parent in the house. So they didn't get taught things like, you know, how to tie a tie or how to fix a sink. If you go on YouTube, there are hours and days probably, millennia of worth of videos of people teaching you how to tie a tie, how to fix a sink, how to be handy around the house, little basic stuff that boomers never bothered to pass along. Um, and so hopefully millennials will be able to scrape together enough of the civilizational knowledge that didn't get passed down to them in order to pass it on to their kids now that millennials are reaching the age of having kids, uh, raising kids of their own. I think the next 10 years are gonna be kind of the, the crunch time for, for that project. And I think technology has a big role to play in it. In our last four minutes here, um, and Delian, I'll start with you because we, we talked about this before we started. I would love everyone just to bring up some data point or issue. It's just deep interest to them because this is actually a really interesting mix of a panel here. You're, you know, you're talking about fertility and different technology. So I think we've got like a minute and a half per panelist just to give some specific thing that they're interested in and go from there. Yeah, my latest uh, uh, interest area over the past, let's say, you know, year and a half or so has been in sort of, you know, fertility science um, and, you know, sort of perfectly follows this trend where you have these, you know, boomer FDA directors um, that have, you know, a lot of opinions that are tied up to whether it's their religions or um, their fear of the future or their belief in what a fundamental, you know, family that sh should look like that are preventing millennials from necessarily having the families that they want to. Right now, if you're a woman in the United States and you want to you know, have a natural born child over the age of 50, that's effectively you know, impossible. Um, and yet there is science today that exists that's been relatively well demonstrated in uh, you know, Japan. Uh, they took a skin cell from a mouse, turned that into a stem cell, turned that stem cell into an embryo, implanted that embryo into another mouse. That mouse then birthed a live, healthy mouse. 
Uh, and so there are ways today for a 50-year-old woman to, whether through stem cell technologies or egg donor surrogacy, to actually choose to have a child at age 50, but we don't allow it in the United States because we technically consider that gene therapy because you're messing with the you know, genome of the embryo uh, to make it your own genome as opposed to whatever you know, genome it preexistingly had, or you're creating life from scratch from these stem cells. And this to me is a classic thing where it's preventing from millennials from having the number of children when they want, how they want to have them, despite the technology existing, entirely due to sort of boomer institutions um, you know, arbitrarily choosing a set of moral, ethical, scientific rules that have no basis, you know, in fact. Saif? The thing that uh, I'm most curious about is something that I call the art of talent war, which is this paradigm we find ourselves in where on one end, we've got adult learners overwhelmingly in abundance in America, many of whom are ill-equipped to compete in the global job marketplace of today. And so on one end, I think that there needs to be a rapid movement uh, to drive upskilling and getting more of those adult learners. It's actually the largest learning market in the world, which is the idea of upskilling adult learners uh, that the, the nice lady that we knew at Dry Clean USA got waylaid by the pandemic. How are we thinking holistically, whether through technology, private operators, public operators, and getting them retooled to be able to be ready for everything that's happening? So that's, that's one. And then, of course, learners, because of the, as a function of my role at a public research university, how is it that we are creating deeper experiential learning pathways that are blurring the lines between campus and career? I think a lot of the stuff that we might be seeing that uh, students experience, that sort of sense of restlessness about where they might fit in the world, quickly goes away when they start to see the value of the types of resources they could be unlocking through experiential learning. So that art of talent war is something that I, it occupies an infinite amount of my time uh, thinking through uh, at from how small businesses will be able to acquire the talent they need all the way to how as a society we're going to be able to have. We can't have a system where we have uh, millions of adult learners that aren't ready for, for the future. And so I think that art of talent war is something that I think we have to double down, triple down on at uh, a multi-layered level in our society. And uh, how in the last word in 30 seconds or less? Uh, well, actually, as a journalist, I don't believe in numbers. Uh, so I, I do not have a statistic for you. Uh, so yeah, we, we'll just skip. <laughs> Read Boomers. That's where you will get everything from how and you need to hear. Everyone, this has been really great. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the audience.